All right, if you have your Bible, turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. This is the whole point of our series. How many of you want God to do something incredible in your life, in your family? This is the requirement. This is the requirement. Before we talk about reframing and all the practical things you can do, Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all, everyone say all, my favorite Greek word, means the same in English, with all of your heart. In other words, with all of your being, with everything you are in every area of your life, seek me. If you seek me, you will find me, but that's the requirement. God doesn't just want part of you, he wants all of you. And if you're not willing to give God all of you, you will never be all that God's created you to be, and you will never be able to move in the direction he's calling you to move. Today, we're going to talk about how to reframe your perspective. Again, I'm going to cover lots of things. I'm going to stay very close to my notes because I really believe if there was one message that I could teach, one, and I never taught another one, it would be this one. I believe there are so many, so many practical biblical things in this message that I'm praying that God gives you just one or two things to think about this week as you reframe where your eyes are. Everything positive and negative in your life is a result of where you put your eyes. For example, when you stare at something, you multiply that something in your life. If you're looking at all the, all the, all the things that annoy you about your spouse, guess what you're only going to see? If you're focusing about all the things that drive you crazy in the culture, I can relate. If you haven't followed me on social media this week, I'm back, baby. Come on. (laughs) Guess what? That's going to be all that you see. And it is a sin for a believer. Listen to me. We we understand sins, you know. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't murder. Don't mess with somebody else's spouse. Come on. We all know those sins. But you know it's a sin for a Christian to be in despair. It's a sin for a Christian to retreat from culture. It is a sin. It's a lack of faith and it's an abundance of fear. And so wherever your eyes are are where you're going to go. So what I want to do today is I want to start with this power, with this message on the power of vision. I want you to think about this for a moment because I believe this is what God wants to do. God wants to call all of us up. When we talk about perspective, notice God called Moses to the top of the mountain. He didn't say, hey, come down to me. See, we say that a lot. We do. Hey, come down to me. Hold me. Cuddle me in my, in my despair. Right? God says, no, 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 no. I'll heal you. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll give you fresh vision for your life, but you're coming up the mountain. I'm not coming down. He already came down. His name was Jesus. He died on a cross and he rose from the dead. And guess where he's sitting now? So every time the Holy Spirit wants to do something in our life, he calls us up the mountain. He changes the way that we see. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. There is nothing better than living according to God's plan and having his perspective on life. What I want to do is I want to lay out a framework because there is a hierarchy to how God works. Without hierarchy, there is no order. For example, we talked about your faith first. If your faith is off, if you don't prioritize that, none of the other things we're talking about are really going to matter. It's all going to be just behavior modification. You're going to do it for a while until something, not if, but when, something distracts you, something fills your schedule, you're going to go back to being the same way you were before. There is a hierarchy to how God, uh, how God wants you to see. So the first thing I want to talk about, is I'm going to do three things today. I'm going to talk to you about three commands that Jesus gives to every believer. They have to be number one in your thinking. They have to be number one in your looking and your seeing. Three commands God gives all believers. And then I want to give you a template for how God works to transform your life. We've covered this before, but I want to revisit that template. Because as you begin to see different, you're going to have to actually think different. Then we're going to stop, we're going to share a three-step process for discovering how to actually find God's plan for your life. In other words, where are you in God's vision? Personal vision is not about your hopes and dreams, because apart from your creator, they're always going to be less than what they could be. And so we're going to talk about that. Matthew 6.33, this is a big theme, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness 
and all, my favorite word, and all these things shall be added to you. When you put God first and you care about what he cares about, every other thing that you care about is gonna be taken care of. I've noticed this walking with Christ for nearly 30 years. I've, wa- I've watched it. It's like, I was so stressed. I'm so hyper-focused on all the things that I need. When I just stop doing that and I start focusing on what God has commanded me to do, that's so clear in scripture. Let me say it this way. When you're unclear about what to do, go back to what you are clear about. That's the power of scripture. There are lots of things in our life. Does anybody know exactly where you'll be in five years, in two years, in a month? I'm going to be in the Dominican Republic next week, so I know exactly where I'm going to be. Come on. We don't know where we're going to be. The further you get out, the more hazy or foggy it is. So this is the power of scripture. And this is why these three commands from Christ are so important. Because in all seasons, in every place, if we do these three things, which is to seek him first, because these are the three things he cares the most about and has commanded every believer to do and the church to care the most about, then as we're walking, that fog begins to lift. As we're serving him, right, we begin to hear the Holy Spirit for where he wants us to go professionally, for where he wants us to go in our family or maybe in the different areas that he's called us to work on. Does that make sense? And so there are three commands of Jesus. This is, this is interesting. I'm going to go through these pretty fast because if you've gone through Membership University, you already know these. These guide our church. They shouldn't just guide our church, though. They should guide your life. The church is only as strong as its weakest member. The church is only as effective as the person who understands these the least. And so we've got to nail down on them. After Jesus' resurrection and before his ascension on the Mount of Olives, He gave three distinct commandments. Many of us think of the Great Commission. There are actually three. There are three things that he told us to do. They are in order by time, okay? And they are also given to different different disciples at different times. They're written by different gospel writers. Just so that we wouldn't miss it, it is crystal clear. On the night of the resurrection, you might remember all the disciples are being censured, censured by the government on social media. Do you remember that? You remember the truth of God's word, of the kingdom, the beatitudes, that was called hate speech and they were called bigots. They were so scared of what happening to them, what happened to Christ. They were huddled up in the upper room. Many theologians believe this is the same place where Jesus had the last supper. They still, they, they hadn't checked out yet. They had another day or three. They're up there terrified. The Bible says the door was locked. They were so scared. Jesus walked through the door. I don't even know how he did that, but he was in a new body. We're gonna get one too. I, that's gonna be cool. I can't wait. He walks in, and this is what he says in Mark 16. Go into all the world and preach. Everyone say preach. Don't shut up. That's the first thing you're going to want to do when pressure comes at you. Do not stop preaching the good news to everyone, even those who are going to pick up stones to stone you, even those who are going to cancel you. This is the very first thing he tells us to do. If we won't speak, courage is the highest of all virtues. You know why? Without courage, you can't do anything else. They were in fear. He says, be in faith and don't shut your mouth. They hated me. They will hate you. Just accept it. But I will do great things. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But then he also says, anybody who doesn't will be condemned. That's not our department. Our responsibility is to preach. Two weeks later on the Sea of Galilee, he gives another. And he adds to this. You might remember he's in the same place, theologians believe, where he called his original disciples. Incidentally, it's also where all of them ran to when they failed. What do you do when you think that you don't measure up as a Christian? You go back to your old life. Jesus said to these men, you will be fishers of men, but that didn't really work out. And so what did they do? They went back to be fishers of fish. He shows up and he calls them back to the mission he's called them to. He says this in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. I know you're scared of the government. I know you're wondering if I can forgive you, but I've been given all authority, not just here, but also in heaven. Therefore, go and make disciples of all, there it is again, that word, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey. Everyone say obey. Obey. To obey all, there's that Greek word again, all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always even when you feel alone, even when you feel like nobody understands you, even when everybody leaves you, I will never leave you. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
It isn't enough to just speak the truth. God requires you to actively engage in raising his family. That's messy, but he calls us to do it. Then on the, then, then before ascending into heaven on the Mount of Olives, okay, he says this to his disciples. He says, do not start doing these things until I send the helper or the Holy Spirit. He tells us to act in the power of the Holy Spirit. He says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This book was also called Luke Acts. It was written by Luke. It's a continuation. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Why are a lot of Christians worn out? Burnout is like not a biblical idea, by the way. We have so much therapeutic discourse, it's disgusting. I don't even refer anymore because they're not thinking according to scripture and how God made you. They're thinking, I'm just, let me just say it this way. You're not fragile. God didn't make you that way. When you do things his way, he provides a way and shows you the way. That's really what this series is all about, to give you courage, hope, and faith that God has given you everything you need right where you are to do everything he's called you to do. You don't have to be a slave to depression, anxiety, to fear. You don't have to, you don't, you don't have to be, you don't have to be attached to all of those things. I think a lot of believers are worn out and they tap out way too soon because they do it in their own strength. I'm gonna be, I, I, listen, I've tried to reach people and make disciples in my own strength. They all left and planted other churches. Not like they're not around anymore. They, 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 they all did the opposite of what I wanted them to do or what I thought they should do. And it, and it was freedom when I realized that my identity is not connected to how well you obey Christ. I'm not responsible for you. I am responsible and I will give an account to God, a greater one, he says, for teaching the word and holding you to the line. Whether or not you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it. Only the Holy Spirit makes it, drinks, makes it drink. We plant, we water, but only the Holy Spirit gives growth. That's the Holy Spirit in you speaking to you. Hey, you know what? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Many people, we don't listen to the Holy Spirit before we say yes. And as a result, we're worn out. And quite frankly, we don't follow through on our obligations. Many of us, we don't listen to the Holy Spirit when he tells us to do something. As a result, we struggle in our finances, in our family, in the different areas of our life. We need the Holy Spirit to direct and guide us. That is the only way you will be refreshed. That is the only way you will have the truth. That is the only way you will be filled so that you can pour your life out in reaching and discipling people. So we have an understanding. God gives these commands to every single believer. This is not just your pastor's job. It's not just your pastor's job to organize beast feasts so that we can bring in the community. I love doing that. But guess what I did right when God gave me that idea? I said, man, I ain't doing this alone. Come on, y'all, come help me out. Let's go out and invite people. Let's be engaged. Wherever you are, you may not be the person on the stage. You may be holding open a door. You may be giving a smile. You may be not sneering at a family whose baby's crying and they have to leave. Come on. You have no idea what that does. You may be teaching kids and vintage kids. You may be serving coffee in the energy bar. You may be smiling and having a different attitude in your workplace that stands out like a sore thumb and people come to you and they go, you just seem like a person I can ask advice from. You have no idea what an invitation will do, but you've got to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. Next, we're going to talk about three types of transformation. I have so many notes today. I kind of regret it, kind of don't, because I think God's going to speak to you through them all, but I got to stay on track, okay? Three types of transformation. In other words, there are three things that we've taught repeatedly that give us a template for transformation, okay? The first is the Bible changes how you think. This Greek word is called logos. In the Bible, you can go ahead and reference the scripture there in your notes. So first, everything positive and negative that happens in your life starts in your mind. That's the battlefield. The battlefield is not, I'm broke at the end of the month. It's how you're thinking about money. The battlefield is not, my wife won't listen to me. It's actually, you're probably not leading her the way the Bible told you to. It's not, my husband won't come to church. It's maybe you should give him an incentive by being the wife the Bible calls you to be that he's like, man, I want to get more Christians in my life because this is great. It's always in how you think. Next, the Holy Spirit gives you vision. That's what we're talking about today. And this word vision that the Holy Spirit gives you isn't just broad. I gave you a broad uh, vision for what every single Christian should do. But you know, God has one just for you, right where you are. 
in your business, in your workplace, in your family. He wants to give you a plan in his design. That's the Holy Spirit. The word there is rhema. It's just for you specific. Then the church becomes the vehicle for kingdom authority in action. Where do you practice? Where do you figure it out? Where do you learn to grow? What's the, we, we say this here in, our, in our, the church we see. Kyle and I, when we started the church in 2013, we wrote down what we, what we saw. And we determined that if we can't build a church like this, we don't want to do it. There are more lucrative ways to be miserable than ministry. <laughs> we're called because we're building that. If you haven't read in a while, maybe you should go back and look at it. The church is a greenhouse, just like a family's a greenhouse. Uh, a, a, a guy I follow, I, I think he's great. His name's Jordan Peterson. But he says, never let your kids do anything that makes you dislike them. So good. Because if you as their parents don't like them, nobody's going to like them. Where do you learn that? As a Christian, man, you're learning things and you're in family and, and, and it's a place so that you learn it here so you can be a light there. Does that make sense? It becomes kingdom authority and action. Proverbs 29, 18, I'm gonna say the scripture again. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Let's read that from the message translation. It's excellent. If people can't see what God is doing, in other words, they don't know his vision for them, they stumble all over themselves, but when they attend or give attention to, that's where that word comes from, to what he reveals, they are most blessed. We have a secret here. We have a secret here. 1 John 2.17, and this world is fading away along with everything that people crave, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. There are three callings of every single Christian. Another list for you. You're called to follow Christ. That's number one. We covered that in week one. You're called to remain planted in the church. You are called to a church, not a perfect place. No, 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 no. None, if you've got a family that's perfect, let you be the first person to cast a stone at the church that hurts your feelings or somebody who didn't call you back. Are you following me? It's not about perfection. It's about being planted so that we can be stable. Many people, they keep pulling up their roots in every church. Every time the pastor doesn't do exactly what they want. Now listen, if your pastor is not talking about things he should be talking about in culture, if he's not empowering you to go and be salt and light in the earth, if he's loose and moving away from scripture, I think something like only 37% of pastors have a biblical worldview. That's a problem. Okay, you should leave. But you know what? Somebody didn't call you back. You know, maybe there's a relationship that somebody wasn't nice to you. Jesus tells you what to do in those situations in Matthew 18. And I'm gonna tell you this, big church, little church, doesn't really matter. Are you growing? And I will tell you this, the great thing about a big church is when you find people that you can't stand, there's always more people. Come on. <laughs> you're called to remain planning. Next, you're called to make a difference in this world. That's what we're talking about today. You're called to make a difference wherever you are in this world. In this world. Three steps to developing a personal vision. We're going to focus in on that difference. How can you make a difference in this world? You can vote, yeah. Physical exercise is great, yeah, but how many of you know gravity eventually wins? You, you can have all these little different pieces, but how can you ensure that you're moving in the right direction and that you're putting yourself in the best possible place to make the biggest possible difference with your life? I'm going to give you a formula that I've used for years. I've talked about it a lot. I do want to let you know everything I'm going to talk about for the next few moments, I'm going to actually show you how to do at the Good Steward Workshop. So, so we're, we're taking limited numbers too because there's going to be small groups. There's going to be all kinds of breakouts. It's going to be very, very different than what you've attended. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, you better register. I think we're probably going to take about 100 people. Okay, and so it's about as much room as we have. And so I'm going to actually break down how to do this um, in that workshop. But I want you to be thinking about this. Philippians 3.13, no, dear brothers and sisters, Paul says, I have not achieved it, but I focus on one thing. I'm going to say one. I love this. He says, I focus. What is focus about? I put my eyes on one thing. Forgetting the past, it's over. Looking forward to what lies ahead. I'm not there yet, but I'm excited about it. But in the present, I press on to reach the end of the race, to receive the heavenly prize for which 
God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Here's a few steps to developing a personal vision. First, discover the why of your life. Where should you start? You should start where you end. Should the Lord tarry? Every generation of Christians have believed he could come back at any moment and they hoped that it was their generation. I hope. I hope that's true. People ask me all the time, pastor, are we living in the end days? I said, honestly, it looks like it. I'm not really sure. But one thing I do know, these are your end days. When they're gone, they're gone. Where should you start your funeral? I, I, I've walked people through this exercise and it's incredibly powerful. Write down your eulogy. Take the most important people, start with God, then move to your spouse if you have one. Move to your family, your siblings, your friends, your community, your church. What would you want them to say at your funeral? None of us want anybody to have to lie. I don't lie, I just get quiet. Maybe that's lies of omission for the wicked's funeral. And I've done funerals of righteous people. I didn't have to lie, it was beautiful. I've also done funerals for people who didn't reverse engineer their life. They didn't think about the end. So when they got there, there was nobody around them. When they got there, their impact was limited. There was lots of hurt and pain. When they got there, it wasn't anything like what I could imagine they would have wanted. Proverbs 9, 10, for the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. What happens when you die? You will stand before God and you will give an account. Fear of the Lord is the foundation. There is a God in heaven and I will answer to him one day. We've lost that as a culture. We teach a lot about hope, love, and joy. We don't teach a lot about the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. Those who, are not, those who don't know Jesus, you're going to stand before the great white throne. It's yes or no. Did you make him the Lord of your life? Yes or no. For those of us who said yes, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible says everything we've done is going to be put through a spiritual fire. And anything that remains is our reward. We will be rewarded for even giving a little cup to a kid. Don't think that what you do matter, that doesn't matter, because it does. I tell our staff all the time, hey, I know you're in ministry, but you're still a Christian. And I want to make sure you go to heaven and you have lots of things that remains. By the way, everything we pay you to do, we say thank you and you get your reward on the 1st and 15th of every month. It's not what we pay you to do, it's what you do above and beyond that's going to last. And I will just tell you one thing for all you serve team leaders that are working just as much as our staff. Can I just tell you, God doesn't forget one of those things. You're not working as unto man. You're working as unto God. And one day you're going to get to heaven. You're going to be a little, 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 you know, gripey, the side of heaven when we keep pushing you. But one day you're going to be high five. And I, I had a pastor tell me the definition of pastoral leadership. He said, it's taking God's people where they don't want to go, kicking and screaming so that when they get to heaven, they say, look what me and God did. That's the mission. That's the church. Next, or I'm sorry, eternal perspective determines or orders our priorities. We're going to talk about priorities next. Determine the what and how of your life. This is all about from your eulogy, reverse engineering your life. What do I have to focus on to actually get there? It's one thing to say you want God to say that about you. It's one thing you say you want your spouse to say that about you. But if you never prioritize them, you'll never get there. So what are those relationships, those priorities? I, we've broken down several priorities for you that I want to give you. I have a little wheel here. We're going to put it on the screen. This is also how our discipleship courses are organized. We have one for each one of these. We're in the fitness. I think it's fitness. That's how we say it in the South. Come on, fitness. Fitness, faith, family, finances, freedom. Those are priorities. When you don't have a family, guess what your priority is? Becoming the person who can support someone, can care and nurture for someone. When you get married, guess who's your family? Your wife first, not your mother-in-law or your mom. It's a big problem in marriages. For this reason, a man will leave their father and mother. Leave and cleave. He doesn't say that about women, by the way, so you probably just have to get over it, guys with the in-laws. Okay, anyways... It's funny because it's true. It is. My girls will take care of me when I'm older. And their son -in -law, my son-in-laws will just have to figure it out. Your priorities determine your relationships. So you set, you set your priorities, and then you begin to form your relationships. Your relationships should have a connection to what you've prioritized, and your priorities should have a connection 
to what you want at the end when you stand before God. Those should all be in alignment. God uses us or develop the who of your life. I teach you how to map your relationships. Ecclesiastes 4.12, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Write this down. God uses us, God uses us to grow people and people to grow us. God uses us to grow people. We have a part to play. There are people looking up to you and people to grow us. I think about this in every room I go in. God, who in here? God puts you in every room you're in. Unless it's an evil one. You should leave that room. There are some of those rooms. I think you know what those rooms are. Don't be in those rooms. But God uses us to grow people and people to grow us. I'm going to talk about relationships as we close. Three minutes. I am on time somehow. They're serenading me. Thank you. He's per- you're perfect timing, brother. You're like, come on, let's move it on. Three minutes can go 15 real fast. There are three relationships that you need to think about when you map them out. And I'm going to say this because somebody needs to hear this. God has not called you to be close to everybody. The Bible says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Solomon had all the wisdom in the world, but foreign women worshiping foreign gods led his heart astray. Obviously, that's with your spouse, but it's also with your friendship. Some of you give your life to Christ, you think you can have all those old buddies. It's not true. It is not unloving to not allow wicked people to influence you. Now, that doesn't mean that you write them off. It doesn't mean you, you know, you thump your Bible at them. But there is a distance that begins, you begin to move away from them and closer to the people of God. That's how that's supposed to be. And here's what happens. Most of them come with you because they see the change in you. And so they end up giving their life to Christ as well. But three relationships I want you to think about. I want you to think about a tic-tac-toe board. You guys remember tic-tac-toe? Put yourself in the middle of the tic-tac-toe board. Above you, every Christian needs a Paul who is leading. These are mentors. Not just one. I think at best you'll have three. And it depends on what you're focusing on in your life. I'm a pastor, so I have my, I'm, Pastor Steve Smotherman's right up there. He's my pastor. Okay, I, I, I have somebody in there that helps me with my marriage. Looking after that stuff. Right now we're in a season but we have somebody that's working on our finances. I, 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 you see, they, they mirror the people that we have. You need somebody who you trust more than yourself. And by the way, they don't need you, so you have to pursue them. They're not gonna call you every day. They didn't wake up in the morning thinking about you. Why? Because, well, they're stronger than you. you does that make sense? That's, that's hard for people, especially younger people. You think every relationship's equal? Good luck with that. You know, Peter Pan thought that too. He never grew up and he was in a, make-believe place called Never Never Land. What was the problem? There was no parents. Parents are a blessing. This is why the first commandment with the blessing is honor your mom and dad. Why? Because they've forgotten more than you've ever known. Make sure that you treat them accordingly. Next, everyone needs a Barnabas who is loving. These are close friends. When you hear the scriptures about iron sharpening iron, this is a Barnabas relationship. You need each other. Pauls don't need you. You need them. And they graciously put make time for you in their life as a Timothy. But Barnabases, you need each other. These are typically in your same stage of life, right? You're all, you have little kids, you need some other people with little kids. You know why? Because you need a babysitter. <laughs> you have people in your life, right? That, those, are, those are important relationships. Next, everyone needs a Timothy who is learning and the scriptures are in your notes. But every Tim- every, everyone needs a Timothy who is learning. Meaning that, Okay, you have mentors that you're pulling from. You have brothers and sisters that you're sharpening. Okay, but you also have to carve out time to remember somebody's watching you. You're gonna grow and you're gonna have strength. The word for strength in the Bible is gentleness, which is, it seems opposite, right? But it actually, that word means power under control. Meaning you use your strength to be able to lift other people. Meaning you have to make some time for other people. Is there anybody that you're leading? One of the most fulfilling things in my life at this stage, as I'm learning this, and this is probably gonna be the next 20 years, is how much fulfillment I get seeing other people win. It's one of the most, it's why I'm not, all, I'm not ever in, the, I haven't been in the baptismal forever. I think I baptized my own daughter. Do you know why? It's not because that's not a special moment. I, I, don't, I love being a part of that moment. The picture and remembering and their story and I don't do it. You know why? Because I wanna give that to somebody else. 
it's that meaningful. We have other pastors. We have parents that'll do it with their kids and other leaders and elders. That, that's incredibly meaningful. And by the way, I get great meaning out of that. There was a time when, man, I needed to be in every baptismal photo. Thank God those are over. That doesn't age well, by the way. Pride never does. This is why you've got to be able to turn to the next generation and make room. That's what Timothy's are all about. You don't need a ton of them and you're probably missing some of them right now. That's okay. But, but, but be mindful of the missing square on the tic-tac-toe board because that's what you're believing God for. God, I want a relationship like this. God, show me. You might go through nine before you find one. All of the nine are worth the one. And God uses people to grow you. And we're talking about perspective. We have to put God first. What has God called every believer to do? We have to remember that the way he transforms us is by changing the way we, we think through his word and the Holy Spirit and our place in the local church. And finally, we have to begin to have a vision for our own life. It's your life. God wants to do something incredible through it. Keep your eyes on him. Prioritize the right things and make sure that you pray for the right people to bring, that he wants to bring into your life. Let me, let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for every single person here. I thank you, Father, for this series. I, I thank you, God, really for your word, which gives us such a clear template for how to win in every area of our life. I just pray, God, that whatever your people need to hear this morning, they would hear it. They would, that, 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 Lord, those words sown that maybe, maybe they don't know what to do with yet, Lord, they're, they're like seeds in their heart. Father, if they keep watering, eventually when they need it, it it'll spring up and it'll be everything they need. I, I pray, God, that you speak to your people this week, that if there's some things that need to shift, that need to realign, there's some things that need to come out of their life and come into their life, I pray that the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit would give wisdom and direction in each and one of our lives. God, I also pray for anybody in here that's far from you. I pray they would not leave this place the same way that they came in. Maybe you're in here and you're far from God. Let's stay in an attitude of prayer, heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're in here and you're far from God, I don't have to embarrass you. I don't have to call you forward, single you out. You know if you're playing with God and your life shows it. After following Christ for 30 years, I can save you a lot of heartache and pain. You will never be all that God created you to be apart from your creator. You can't know him apart from Jesus, accepting that what the Bible says about him is true, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead. And in doing so, he has the power to save you, to redeem you, to create you new. And his heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe you're in here and at one point you followed Christ, but you're not following him anymore. You need to get back on track. Maybe you're in here and you've never given your life to Christ because of your own pride. You've never acknowledged the God in heaven. And as a result, your life is full of all kinds of pain and issues. God wants to alleviate those, but he won't do it on your terms. He only does it on his terms. And his terms are always better for you. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around. If you're here today and you just say, Pastor, between you, me, and God, I need your prayer. Would you just acknowledge that by lifting up your hand and say, I want to get it right today. Thank you. Hands go up all over the room. It's good. It's good. Thank you. I see you. What's more important than me seeing you is God sees you. Jesus says that when you acknowledge him before men, I'll acknowledge you before the Father. That's what you just did. That's a big deal. But it doesn't end there. God's not a tyrant. He doesn't force you to do anything. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of surrender. Surrendering your life to Christ. It's going to become an on-ramp for him to move in your life. The good thing about God is he meets you right where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. We won't leave you there either as a church. We're going to give you all kinds of steps and things that you can do to begin to grow, to begin to really, really thrive as a believer in your faith. But first, you've got to confess with your own mouth what you believe in your heart. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer from Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Allow this prayer to be an expression of why you raised your hand. I believe God's going to meet you there. It's going to be a moment you're going to be able to remember in time where everything changed. Church, we believe in what they're doing. We're also going to pray loud and in faith this prayer out loud so as to encourage them. Let's all pray this together. Let's pray, Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth, for living a perfect life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I believe that you are good and that you're God. I believe on the third day after you were killed on the cross, I believe you resurrected from the dead. 
I believe you conquered death to give me life. And so today, of my own free will, I choose to make you my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Lead me and guide me. Show me what's next. It's in your name that I pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's put our hands together for everybody who did that.